Alrighty. So this is written homework problems for week 10. Just really all straightforward probability stuff. Not too bad. Shouldn't take us um, too long, hopefully. Um, but yeah, I thought it was it was pretty straightforward. And I wrote up the uh, examples, like the uh, sample um, explanations on like a PDF document. I sent it in the group me and it's also uploaded on the Google Drive for you to access. It should just be under like the homework review sessions and then like a folder called written homework 10. Um, so there's that as well. I didn't like post any, you know, answers directly because obviously I want you guys to like work through these, but obviously like once we're working through these live, obviously we're going to go through some answers as well and just kind of check. Um, but let's start it off with problem one. So from one short questions, we have xenon fluoride has a, or wait, yeah, xenon hexafluoride, I guess. So that has a molar mass of 245.3 grams per mole. How many molecules are in 1.2 kilograms of this substance? So this kind of a throwback to chemistry. And very, very simply, and this is kind of how I explained it as well with the um, document, is that you kind of look at what you have initially and what you want to get to. So we have kilograms, right? We have some kind of mass um, initially. And so we also have our molar mass. And then we're trying to figure out like molecules, right? So we have, you know, kilograms will just, we'll convert that to grams to match the units here. So that's like 1,200 grams, right? And so we have grams, we have grams per mole, and we need molecules. So how can we relate these three together? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. That's right on the dot. So we're going to start off with our 1200 grams, right? Which is the 1.2 kilograms. And like Isley said, we're going to multiply by our molar mass here. So we have one mole over 245.3 grams, right? And then we know that in one mole, there's Avogadro's number of molecules, right? So that's 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. I just abbreviate that as M-O-L-E-C. And then, um, I forgot to grab my calculator. So that should be around like 2.95, I think. Yeah, 2.94, 2.95 um, times 10 to the 24 molecules. There. So that should be your um, number of molecules for part A. Does that make sense? We go from grams multiply that by the molar mass to get the number of moles, and then multiply that by Avogadro's number to get the number of molecules. All right, and then this problem is just kind of all over the place. It's just kind of testing whether you understand just general concepts, I suppose. And so part B is totally unrelated. It says, if you flip a fair coin three times and they all come up heads, what is the probability of getting um, a fourth head on the next flip? So. I think, if I remember correctly, the way I kind of went about this, um, yeah, and it's, yeah, exactly, Farrell has, it's one half. So essentially to, to think about this, right, an independent process is kind of like saying like, um, you know, one process is completely independent of another. So there's no memory of, you know, the past. So if I flip a coin right now, right, I can either get heads or tails. Now, if I flip a second coin or flip that same coin, right, a second time, well, that coin has no memory of what the previous flip was, right? So say I get heads the first time. If I flip the coin a second time, right, that, you know, whether I get heads or tails is not dependent on whether I got heads or tails for the first flip. So the second process, the third process, the fourth process, whatever, um, does not have any memory of what came before. So if I don't know what happened in the past, it has no effect on what's going to happen in the future. 
Um, that's how I kind of think about independent processes. So they are completely independent of um, what's going on in the past, right? Now, a dependent process would be different. So for example, like I remember in elementary school, we'd always have this type of exam example. So like if you, I guess, um, had the, you know a drawer for, full of socks, right? Um, and you took out a sock and you didn't put it back. Well, then the probability of pulling out like whatever color sock is dependent on the fact that you had taken out a sock, right? Now, we're not saying that the socks have memory per se because they don't have a mind, they don't have a brain, but essentially the process is now dependent on what happened before, right? Because now you've decreased the amount of socks inside the drawer um, as opposed to putting it back where you wouldn't have decreased the amount of socks. So all in all, independent processes don't have any memory of what came before. They're independent. Um, so rolling you know, or flipping heads or tails, right? For each process doesn't matter or it doesn't depend on what happened before so in this case um our probability for you know flipping the coin and getting heads or tails or a, our fourth head in this case right would be one half um, if i flip it for the tenth time on that tenth time i still have one half as my probability because it's completely independent of what happened before does that make sense All good? Cool. Um, okay. And then obviously, like, I, if I kind of confused anyone, please let me know. Um, and then also, like, I think I did, I, at least I, in my personal opinion, I think I did a decent job, at least, of writing down some coherent explanations um, for all these, like, conceptual type problems in the uh, PDF that I uploaded. Um, but yeah, moving on to part C. So part C says, if the temperature T of a gas doubles, by what factor does the average kinetic energy um, of the individual molecules change? And then they also ask, by what factor does the RMS speed change? So we're looking at the temperature doubling, right? And we're trying to figure out how does that change the average kinetic energy, right? So what equation do we know that kind of relates average kinetic energy to temperature? Yeah, exactly, right? So average kinetic energy is equal to 3 halves kBT, right? So if we were to double the temperature, we should just take 3 halves kB times 2T, right? Well, we see that even before this, we see that the average kinetic energy is directly proportional to the temperature. So if we double this, we just doubled the entire kinetic energy, right? Or the entire average kinetic energy. So in other, in other words, if I just take this two, right? And maybe like drag it over and I do this. It's as if I was saying, I just took, oops, this is really awkward. Um, I just took like two times this whole thing right here. So this is three halves KBT, this is my average kinetic energy so that's saying two times the average kinetic energy so i just doubled the average kinetic energy by doubling the gas temperature so that's what would happen if you double the temperature of the gas you double the average kinetic energy because they're directly proportional now now they're asking about what factor does the rms speed change so we know that our rms speed right that's going to be equal to the square root of 3 kbt over m, right, our mass. So what would happen if we were to double the temperature? If we were to just do 3 kb times 2t over m, what does that do? Excellent. Yeah, it would increase by square root two. So it's not doubling the RMS speed because think about this being writ rewritten as root three KBT over M times root two. You know, just based on like previous mathematical knowledge, like, right, if you can, you can multiply like two square roots together or, you know, two radicals together, right? So in this case, this is once again, the same as saying like, I would just put this whole thing under one radical and say 3kb 
times t times 2 over m, which is 3kb 2t over m, right? So I just double the temperature, and that would mean I would be multiplying root 2 by the RMS speed, right? Because the RMS speed here is root 3kbt over m. So I just took root 3kbt over m and multiplied it by root 2, right? Because that's the same as just doubling the temperature within the radical. So if I double the temperature within the radical, it's the same as saying that I'm multiplying the original radical here, which is 3kbt over m, multiplied by root 2. So the factor by which the RMS speed changes is root 2. So root 2 for the RMS speed, and it doubles for the average kinetic energy. Does that make sense? And radical is just another word for like the square root sign. Any questions at all? <clears throat> we all good? Okay. Cool. <laughs> Alrighty, so now we're moving on to problem two. So problem two is random motion of 100 particles. So it says a scientist is measuring the random motion of 100 small particles in a long, very thin tube. And then with the aid of time-lapse photography, she locates all the particles at a given time. And again, 20 seconds later, she measures the displacements on the positive or negative x direction and counts the number of particles that travel different distances from their starting points. Motion in one direction is arbitrarily called negative and in the opposite direction is positive. The following table is obtained. So we have all these different types of probabilities, right? And then with their respective um, displacements. So to travel negative 30 micrometers, there's a probability of 0 0.01. To travel zero micrometers, probability of 0 0.4, right? On and on and on. So um, for part A, it's asking, what is the probability that one of the molecules chosen at random has traveled 15 micrometers or more from its starting location? So we're kind of limited in a sense if we were to think about this um, more broadly. So 15 micrometers, do we see 15 micrometers here anywhere? No, right? Well, when they say 15 micrometers or more, right? Well, that could mean 15, that can mean 16, 17, 18, right? There's a lot of values in between that are a little iffy, right? We don't know about those values. But what we do know and what we can calculate, right, is a specific condition, right? That specific condition is probability that x is going to be greater than or equal to 15 micrometers, right? So we know for sure we have recorded certain distances that are greater than 15 micrometers we've recorded and that's by the way traveling right that's going to be distance um rather than just like displacement alone so that means like um so if i travel like 15 or 16 micrometers either in the positive or in the negative direction right so that would mean that positive 20 here and negative 20 both qualify as well as positive 30 and negative 30 right because whether it be in the negative direction or, or positive direction, I'm traveling in general 15 micrometers from the starting location. Doesn't matter what direction I move, right? So um, in this case, when we're looking for this qualifier here, what is greater than 15 micrometers? Well, we know that 20 is greater and 30 is greater as well as negative 20 and negative 30. So when we're asking about the probability that the displacement, right, on the, the you know distance that we traveled is greater than 15 micrometers from the starting location. Essentially, we're just going to be adding up all the probabilities um, that would help check off this qualifier here, right? So, like I said, 20 and 30 qualify, negative 20, negative 30 qualify. So you're just adding like, well, let me kind of try and circle these in a better fashion. So these four values right there. So 0 0.01, 0 0.06, 0 0.06, 0 0.01, right? Because that'll just be the, um, the four distances or displacements that 
we know of that we have collected data about um, that qualify or check off the um, probability like value that we're looking for, right? Because there's there's bound to be like 22 or 23 or whatever, right? Um, or 17, 18, but we don't know that. So we just base it off on um, what we do know, which is the um, data values that we've collected. So you would just do like 0 0.01 plus 0 0.06 plus 0 0.01 plus 0 0.06, right? And then that should give you what? 0.14, right? Excellent. So that's part A. So you come up with like the probability that you're looking for. So we're 15 or more, right? So X is greater than or equal to 15. That's kind of like your qualifier there. You look at what you know matches up with that qualifier. So I know that 10 is not 10 is not greater than or equal to 15, and neither is negative 10 nor zero. But I know that 20 and 30 are, and negative 20 and negative 30 are because they're all 15 micrometers or more from the starting location, right? Negative or positive doesn't matter as long as they're 15 micrometers or more from the starting location. And just saying this now, keep an eye out for this type of problem because this is gonna be a favorite type of problem that they pull on the quiz some decently, sure, I guess, but yeah. So hopefully part A that part of A of that made sense. But um now part B they're asking us to draw a histogram of the probability distribution given describing the molecules displacements label both axes, right? So we've kind of seen um or I guess yeah, I mean like in lectures you guys have seen um, the histograms before bar graphs, right? Usually you're gonna have like your probability on the y-axis, right? Your percentages or whatever, and then um, you're gonna have like your data values on the the x-axis, right? So in this case, our measurement here is displacement, right? So this is displacement in micrometers, right? Now what's a little bit different about this is this is a histogram, not a bar graph. So this is really important to watch out for. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure how important because I know there's a million people that did regular old bar graphs, right? Um, and I, I'm not sure if they lost points or not. I didn't really ask. But a there's like clear distinctions between histograms and bar graphs, right? So hist like a, a bar graph kind of looks like this. Oops, it's not really straight. There we go. So just very unscientifically and unstatistically our bar graph is usually going to be like the bars will be separated they won't be touching each other right and they'll indicate like specific values right though like this one will be like negative 30 negative 20 or negative 10 or whatever right they'll still be able to show you valuable information it's just i'm saying like my argument is that this isn't what they asked for technically um I'm not really 100% sure if the professors accepted it and they were fine with it, but I'm assuming that they were they were okay as long as you have some data to show that you like understand what's going on. You can translate this into some kind of statistical graph. But in my opinion, and I got full points for this, I drew it as an actual histogram. And so the difference between a histogram and a bar graph, at least visually, um, roughly, is going to be the fact that A, the bars are generally going to be touching each other like this, right? They all are touching each other. And at the same time, they don't show individual values. They're not like negative 30, negative 20, negative 10, like we have over here. They're going to be ranges of values. So it'll be like negative 35 to negative 25, negative 25 to negative 15, negative 15 to negative 5, whatever, right? And so the goal here is to have these values right here, your, your displacements, be in the middle of each bar graph or each um, each histogram like block, right? So negative 30 is right smack dab in the middle between negative 35 and negative 25, right? And then same thing for negative 20, right in the middle here. And so that's just how I kind of set up mine and I didn't lose any points for that. So essentially you just go about 
setting up these blocks with a specific range. I Like I said, I just did negative 35 to negative 25, negative 15, negative 5, for example, right? Um, you can set it up however you want as long as, like, I guess you have your um, displacement in the middle, right? So, like, negative 30 should be in the middle of that range. Negative 20 should be in the middle of that range. Negative 10 should be in the middle of that range, and so on and so forth. And so, um, obviously, then you have your probability on the y-axis, right? And so, like, let's look at negative 30, for example. So, that's 0 0.01. Well, that's pretty small. So, that might be, like, right here, for example, right? And then we have 0 0.06 for negative 20. So, that might be a little bigger. Might be, like, here, right? And then... If we skip forward, this is just totally not right, but if we skip forward to like, I don't know, zero. Zero is somewhere in the middle here. Let's let's just pretend that it is. But zero is like 0 0.4, right? Yeah, it's like 0 0.4 probability. So that'll be really tall, like that, essentially. And remember that all the, the bars have to kind of like be touching each other. And then you have your um, displacement value um, for each of these like right in the middle of your ranges. That's personally how I set it up. If you feel more comfortable doing a bar graph, I really don't think they, they'll have a big issue with it. But like I said, just based on the question, what they're asking, drawing a histogram, I mean, that's how I would set up mine. In fact, you know what? Just to kind of be safe, I guess. Um, let me take a quick picture and kind of attach what mine looked like real quick. Let me just grab my phone or something. So, okay, let me try and copy this over. Oh, phenomenal. Okay, that's how I kind of set up mine, I suppose. Sorry for the um, rough image, but let me kind of erase this real quick. So as you can see, like I have my probability, y-axis, x-axis, I actually forgot to put my displacement here, but yeah, displacement in micrometers should be down here as, a, as your title. And then you have your probabilities from zero to one because your probability should be adding up to one here. And so I just had my bar graph like that, where I have each value is in the middle, right? So negative 30 is in the middle of here, negative 20 is in the middle of here, negative 10 is in the middle of here, right? Um, and the reason why I say like the middle and stuff is if we skip forward and we'll see this later, um, this is a poor histogram because they're not touching. But essentially what they have here is that um, the central value is the one that we're examining. So always have your like central value that you're looking at, like negative 30, negative 20, be right in the middle of your range, and then make sure that all your um, graphs are touching each, or all your uh, blocks are touching each other. Um, that's just the way to, to do a histogram, as far as I remember from stats. Does it matter how much we scale the y-axis? Um, I don't think so. Doesn't matter. As long as like you have your, uh, all your probabilities there showing accurately. I just did mine from zero to one just to, I guess, I don't know. I really don't remember why, but as long as everything is um is accurate, you're good. Because essentially, like, scaling is just going to either make it look zoomed out or zoomed in. So, like, mine, since I scaled mine by 0 0.1, it gonna, it's going to look a little zoomed out. So if you do by 0.2, for example, or whatever, it might um, look a little bit more zoomed in, I suppose. So, yeah. Does that make sense for part B? <laughs> cool. Yes, no. Okay. Cool. Alrighty. So now we're moving on to problem three. 
which is modeling a random walk. So this problem says a mathematician decides to test probability by doing a random walk. He flips a fair coin and takes a one meter step right if it's heads and one meter step left if it's tails. So right is heads, left is tails. After any number of coin tosses, he's at position X. Take X equals zero as his starting location. So now part A is saying, after flipping the coin three times, what are the possible final X positions of the mathematician? So if I think about it right, a really basic example would be like, okay, well, if, if I flipped the coin three times and I got three heads, for example, right? Well, that's gonna be H, H, H. And then based on like what he says here, that it, if it's heads, then it's right. So then the direction would be right, 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 right. And so that's one meter each time. So this translate to plus three meters, right? So if X equals zero is the starting location, he moved to the right three times and each time he takes one meter steps. So his final position would be three meters. That's an example, right? So for each possible final position, list exactly what sequence of steps led to that position. Um, so like I said, yeah, RRR would be a sequence corresponding to the final position plus three meters. So first of all, right, if we're flipping this coin three times, how many total outcomes should we have? Eight outcomes, right? Excellent. And that's because little rule, I guess, roughly, is you take like your number of outcomes like in the original process um, and then raise it to the power of how many times you flip or how many times you do the procedure. So translating that, right, I can either have heads or tails for my first coin flip, right? So that's two outcomes. And I flip the coin three times, so that's how many times I repeat it, so a total of eight outcomes. So you take your outcomes from the original process, right? How many, you know, what outcomes can I get if I, by flipping a coin, either heads or tails? So that's two outcomes. And then I raise it to the power of how many times I repeat the process. So if I flip it three times, two to the third, so eight outcomes. Now, we kind of have to, this is the tedious part, we have to list out, um, you know, the uh, different positions, um, different possible positions here. This takes might take a little while. So we already have one, which is R, 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 right? That would be like heads, 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 right? Um, what else do we have? We have L, 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 right? We can have R, R, L. You guys can go ahead and just like, just say whichever ones you have in the chat, I suppose. R, L, R. Let me just make sure that we don't have any repeats. So L, R, L. Do we have R, R, L? Yeah, we do have R, R, L. L, L, R. We need two more, I believe. L, R, R. Okay, and then we have one more. And R, L, L, I think. I think that sums it up. R, 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 L, R, L, R, L, R, 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 L, 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 R, L, 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 R, L, L, L. I can only imagine how I sound to my family right now. I probably sound like I'm spitting like code. <laughs> it's just a bunch of random letters. Morse code, yeah. R -r 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 -l 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 -l. Okay, all right. I probably sound like a seal. All right, so those are our eight outcomes. And then we can start translating essentially what these mean, right? So if I move three times to the right, like I said before, that's plus three meters. Three times to the left, that's gonna be negative three meters. Two times to the right and one step back to the left will have me at positive one meter, right? Step to the right, a step to the left, and a step to the right will have me at positive one, right? Because you start out at zero. So zero, you move to the right one, 
you move back to the left, you end up at zero, and then you move back to the right again, you end up at one. LRL, that's gonna be what? Negative one meter? <laughs> okay, all right. Um, LLR is negative one meter. LRR is positive one meter. And RLL is negative one meter. Anybody need any clarification for why these are the values they are? You guys can see these, right? I don't know if for some reason it's, um, it looks on my screen that everything's shifted off to the left. But yeah, um, that's pretty much what you should have for, for part A, just all the possible outcomes and um, their associated positions, associated final positions. So this would be what you need for part A. Now, for part B, it's a continuation of that. Now they're asking for the probability of each of the final positions. So when you're asking, asking for probability of x, right? So if I'm asking for a probability of ending up at th positive 3 meters, right? Well, that's just going to be how many times I ended up at 3 meters, so like my favorable outcomes, right? How many times I end up at 3 over my total, which is 8. So how many times did I end up at 3 meters, positive 3 meters? Oh, this is negative 1. I don't know why I erased it. So 1 out of 8, right? So probability of positive 3 is 1 out of 8. How about the probability of negative 3? One out of eight, yep. Now probability of one. Three out of eight, right? One, two, and three. Now probability of negative one should be the same. Three out of eight. So one, two, and three, right? And if you add these up just to check, three out of eight plus three out of eight, six out of eight, 7 out of 8, 8 out of 8, 1, right? So your probability should always add up to 1. So essentially we just took, so if we're looking for probability of plus 3, for example, we take the number of favorable outcomes over the total outcomes. So how many times did we actually get plus 3 meters? That was once out of 8, so 1 out of 8. How many times did we get 1? Well, 1, 2, 3 times, right? So 3 times out of 8 total outcomes, and so on. Now, for part C, it gets a little bit more complica complicated here with the calculations, but we're looking for our average squared, and then we get, it's just basically like average squared again, but this is a little different, and I'll explain why here in a sec. Um, this would be like our squared average, I don't know what, exactly, I can't remember what it's called, but then this is our RMS average, and this is sort of like our standard div here. So if we're looking for our average squared with the exponent outside the brackets, right? That's going to be basically taking the average and then whatav whatever average you get, take the square take the square of that, right? So how can we figure out the average? Yeah, excellent. Exactly. So you take, this is more like mathematically, but essentially, yeah, you're right. You take your initial x, right, or whatever x value, or whatever value you're interested in calculating, um, like the probability for or whatever, um, and you multiply that by the probability for each um, outcome. So, for example, I have 3, right, positive 3 meters. I had a probability of 1 eighth, right, so I took my 
exposition multiplied by the probability of that exposition, so 3 times 1 8th, and then, for example, negative 3 times 1 8th, right? And then positive 1 times 3 8ths, and then negative 1 times 3 8ths, right? So all in all, that should add up to what? So this is 3 eighths minus 3 eighths, so that's 0. And then 3 eighths minus 3 eighths, and that's another 0, right? So this whole thing should just be end up being 0. Now, to get the average and then square that, that's just taking 0 squared, which is just 0 again. Does that make sense? So when this exponent is on the outside, you figure out your entire average as you would normally, and then whatever your answer is, square that. So this, for example, was like four, right? Then we do four, oops, we do four squared. And so your um, average squared would be 16, for example. So if your average was four, your average squared is 16. So you just take four squared. So you figure out your entire average, right? And then you square that. So this average was zero. And then to figure out the average squared, it's zero squared. And that's just zero again. Does that make sense? And that's slightly different from what we're about to do, which is like x squared with the exponent on the inside. Make sense so far? Now, this next step here where you find like the average squared but when the exponent is on the inside is basically the same as finding the average. The only difference now is that you take each like position or x value that you're interested in, whatever it could be. It could be a speed, for example, like a, a 300 meters per second or whatever, um, and you square that. So you take three squared and three squared here and one squared here and one squared there. Let me kind of separate these two a little bit like that. Um, and especially with these negatives, because this might throw your calculator a bit off. So let me actually, you know what, not, not erase the whole thing, but let me kind of adjust this a little bit just so that it um, is more calculator friendly, I suppose. It should be like plus negative 3 squared times 1 eighth. And then this should be like plus negative 1. Well, let me actually yeah, throw this like that. Negative 1 squared times, what is it, 3 8 Yeah, like that. Because I, I don't know, you never know with like the PEMDAS errors that you might get. Like, I don't know. Um, I just prefer to kind of do some parentheses just to make sure that everything looks right and makes sense and doesn't confuse the calculator and whatnot. But that's essentially what you should have for the average squared when the exponent is on the inside. So you just take, it's as if you were taking the average normally, right? So like you take your x value or whatever value you're interested in times your probability of that value. But then what you do is you take that squared. So it's like taking the average, but now you take each like value that you're interested in, square that, and then multiply the probability. So your average is just like your value times the probability, and then your like average squared where the exponent is in within the brackets itself, not outside like here, within the brackets. When it's within the brackets, you do like your average calculation, but you square each like x value or, or whatever it is that you're looking for and then multiply by the probability. When your exponent is on the outside, that just means you're calculating your average as you would normally, and then you take your final answer and square it. And you'll see here that if you go ahead and calculate this whole thing out, what, what, you, what should you get? Three, right? Totally different than zero. Totally different than this zero right here, right? So you see you're just throwing in the exponent on the outside versus on the inside it gives you two totally different values. So don't mix those up. When it's on the outside, so let me kind of write this down on the side here. So exponent on the outside 
take average x answer at the end and square it. And then when exponent is on the inside, do this. So it's like taking your average, but adjust your equation to include a squared on each little value that you have. So if these were, instead of being like, I don't know, what meters, right? If this was like speed, for example, it's like three meters per second, negative three meters per second, right? You take each of those values that you're interested in and then square them and then multiply that by, by their probabilities. So your value squared times your probability. And that's the um, x squared with the x on the in, or the, with the um, exponent on the inside. So there's this. And then here's that. if it'll automatically do a shape here. There we go. Does that make sense for, for part C so far? Any questions at all? Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna do that. I was just making sure everyone understood so far. Sorry if that if I like made it seem like, yeah. No, you're good. I, I yeah, I probably made it seem like a, I was just gonna end the problem and move on. But um, yeah, so that all made sense. XRMS now is just taking the square root of the um, x squared value with the exponent on the inside. So it's essentially taking square root of this value right here which is just the square root of 3. So you don't take the square root of this one, you take the square root of this one. So you take this, your x RMS is the square root of your x squared where the exponent is on the inside. And then for our sigma x, right, our standard div, that should just be equal to x squared with the exponent on the inside, right? Minus x squared with the exponent on the outside, right? So this is root three minus zero squared, right? That should just equal to root three. So x squared with the exponent on the inside, right? That was equal to three. So I plug in that three. And then x squared with the exponent on the outside, right? was the zero squared, right, which is just zero. So three minus zero gives me root three for my standard div overall. Does that make sense? These equations here, right, all these over here and and, um, and this one too and that one, they're all found in the uh, PowerPoint slides and I like um, took screenshots of, of them and kind of posted them in the uh, explanation sheet that I have for the uh, written homework problems. So um, I just have them highlighted and stuff, but hopefully they like make sense because for the uh, standard div here, like I said, you're just gonna be taking your average squared value with the exponent on the inside, right? Which was the three that we calculated before, which is calculated using this equation right here, which you just take like each value that you have that you're interested in, square it and multiply by the probability. So we got three right here. And then this was our average squared, right, so the exponent on the outside, which is just taking the average, and then taking our final answer and squaring that. So this was zero, we squared it, and we got zero again, right? So this is three minus zero is equal to root three. Can you guys hear me now? Is that better? Okay, how about now? I don't know what's going on. Okay, hopefully that doesn't like, maybe it's just an internet thing, but I'm recording like directly, um, like screen recording on my iPad from my computer. So hopefully that doesn't like um, destroy 
like the actual recording. I don't know what's going on to be honest. Yeah, I see that too now that it says like I have a bad connection, I suppose, but I don't know what's going on. Um, hopefully it's not bad now, I guess. Um, well, I'm, shoot, okay, because I don't want to interrupt, like, the, uh, recording, but I don't think it, I don't think it'll interrupt it, I guess, because it's, um, like I said, it's a more, like, a local recording, so let me just, like, try and refresh, I suppose, give me one second here. Okay, is that better? Okay, awesome. All right, and that didn't, I checked and it didn't interrupt the recording because like I said, it was just a local recording for my computer on my iPad, which is good. Because it's not dependent on the um, connection. So, um, yeah. But does that make sense for, for part C? All these equations and whatnot. Um, let me kind of box in, well, let me actually, oops. We kind of box in some of these. This is your XRMS. Right? And then this is your standard div. This is your average X. But yeah. Um, any questions about part C at all? So finally we have problem four, which is quite similar actually to like some of these other problems. And it says a container of gas filled with helium with a molecular mass of four Daltons, which is 6.64 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms, is measured to have the distribution of molecular speeds shown in the histogram to the right. So part A is asking for what is the average speed, right? We're looking for average speed, not RMS speed, so just regular old average speed right um of the helium molecule in the container it says you may approximate all the molecules in each bin as having the speed equal to the central value of the bin all the molecules in the 0 to 200 bin have a speed of 100 meters per second so this is kind of like the what i was alluding to earlier with the histogram right so 0 to 200 our central value is the um so yeah they're saying like approximate the molecules as having the speed equal to the central value so the speed here is 100, right? 0 to 200, right in the middle is 100. 200 to 400, that's 300. 400 to 600, that's 500. 600 to 800 is 700. So just whatever value is like smack dab in the middle, right? And then um, those are the values that we're interested in or that we're going to use, right? That's the speed that's going to, um, I guess, uh, correlate with uh, molecules in each bin. So, um, and we have the percentage right here, or the probabilities for each one. <laughs> so, um, now that they're asking for the average speed, right? So they're asking for average speed, just regular old average, right? Based on the equation I kind of alluded to earlier, for our average, right? So this is just average distance. So if we just take average speed, it should be the same. Instead that it's just our initial, like, or our, our um, velocity value or speed value, right? Times the probability that we actually get that value, right? So if we do the same thing here, right? Well, let's look at the first one. So 0 to 200, what's our value that we're interested in? <laughs> 100 meters per second, right? So 100. And then what's the probability of it? So yeah, 0, 4, 8, and it's right here. So 6, right? Now, do we just multiply by 6? Point zero 0.06 there. Point zero 0.06 because these are all percentages, right? So 6% is point zero 0.06. 
36% is 0.36, right? So we're multiplying, this is what they, this is how they get you, right? Because this is saying percentages, they're not saying probabilities. So if this is six, right, percent, that's 0 0.06, right? That's, that's saying six out of 100, essentially. So we can do the same thing over and over again, right? So for the second part, what do we have for our value? So from 200 to 400, what's the value that we're interested in? 300, right? And then the probability, yep, absolutely right. You have 34% here, right, which is 0.34. And then you just repeat this for every single bar that we have, right? So for 400 to 600, we're interested. Yeah, go ahead. So remember how they said um, the value that we're going to be using it should be this should be the central value of the bin. So it says you may approximate all the molecules in, the, in each bin as having the speed equal to the central value. So from zero to two hundred, the central value is one hundred. Two hundred to four hundred, that's three hundred, is right in the middle. Five hundred is right in the middle of this range. Seven hundred is the middle of this range, for example, and so on. So we're just taking the central value. Yeah. And so, um, so we had 300 for this one, we have 500 for the next one, right? So 500, and then we had 0.36 as being the probability, which is right here. And then we can add um, 700 as the next value, right? Which is the 600 to 800, 700 is right in the middle. And then we had what? Um, this is 16, so, and this is 18 right here. So let's say this is about like 17. Or so yeah 0.17 so 17 percent which is 0.17 and then um, 800 to 1000 should be 900 right in the middle 800 1000 right in the middle is 900 and um, this one had a value about like 5 percent 0 0.05 right because here's four and then here's six so like right in the middle is like five, right? So 5%, 0 0.05. And then we have our final value here, which is the, um, uh, between 1,000 uh, and 1,200, which is 1,100, right? So 1,100, oops, there, 1,100. And then we have a percentage of about 2%, which is 0 0.02, right? So 0 0.24, right? So. 0.02 and that should be our um, value there for the average speed All right so if we do that what should we get Four seventy four, yep, sounds right to me. Four seventy four meters per second, that is. So this isn't average displacement or average distance anymore, this is average speed, right? So our units should be in meters per second. So that's part A. Now for part B they're asking for RMS speed, right? So V RMS, which we know to be the square root of the v squared with the exponent in the on the inside right so remember when we did rms distance right we took the square root of the average squared with the exponent on the inside of the brackets right so we can do the same here where we're taking the square root of the average speed squared with the exponent on the inside and what does that mean what does that mean when the exponent is on the inside 
Anyone want to recap that? Yeah, exactly. So, it's essentially taking this whole thing again. But each time, we're going to be squaring our velocity values, our speed values, sorry. So 100 squared times the probability, 300 squared times the probability, 500 squared times the probability, and so on. Square each of these values, right? So 1100 squared times 0 0.02, uh, 900 squared times 0 0.05, and add all those two to get all those together, and then take the square root. Oops, wow, okay. Take the square root of all of that. Um, that's quite long. So, yeah, um, that's how you'd find the RMS speed. I'll give you guys a second there to calculate that, and we can check. Um, but when the exponent on, is on the inside, right, when you're finding RMS speed or RMS distance or whatever, you take the average squared with the exponent on the inside, which just means that you take your values squared times their probability. So if we have, you know, distance, we take the, each distance squared times the probability, add them up together. So we have 3 squared times the probability, negative 3 squared times the probability, 1 squared times th the probability, right? Same thing where we had here. We had 100 and 300 and 500 and 700 as our values for our speed, right? So we took 100 squared times the probability, 300 squared times the probability, 500 squared times the probability, and so on and so forth, right? We added all those up to get our v squared with the exponent on the inside, and then took the square root of the whole thing to get our RMS speed. Five forty one point six six. I got a little bit off from that. Yeah, I got closer to 518.8 meters per second. Don't know if it's a rounding error or maybe you plug something in wrong slightly. Um, and I know, like, I'm like 99% sure this was a very similar problem on the quiz that we had. And a huge, like, mistake um, that you can catch really quickly is like if for example for whatever reason your values for the uh, percentages here right you did them wrong right so if you if you add them up make sure that they add up to 100 right um, or add up to 1 essentially so since these are all decimals right so 0 0.06 plus 0 0.34 plus 0 0.36 plus 0 0.17 and so on and so forth right add those up make sure that they add up to 1 if they don't add up to one, then you made a mistake. You got to go back and check your probabilities. Um, I know sometimes like it might be a little hard to kind of like estimate the ones that are like in between or whatever. So if like you estimate it incorrectly, it might be off. Like you might have your probabilities add up to like 1.01 .01 or be like 0.99, for example. So I'd go back and check and make sure that you weren't thrown off by anything because that could very well mess up your calculations. Um, so make sure that all your probabilities add up to one. But yeah, that's a really easy mistake to kind of fix and like a little quick sanity check to make sure that um, everything's in order. But that's all for B. Um, part C now, it's asking for the temperature of the helium gas in the container, right? So we want to know the temperature. We have our RMS speed. That was 518.8 right and then what else do we have we have our mass which is the the molecular mass here which is the four daltons right the 6.64 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms so 6.64 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms right so we have our mass we have our speed do we have anything else um pretty much it in terms of the values that we have uh, so essentially, what equations can we use that can involve speed, mass, and temperature, any combinations of those three, 
that would allow us to solve for temperature. Right? So we have, we know that our kinetic energy, there's like two equations that are for kinetic energy, right? For average kinetic energy, that is. So we know that's half mv squared, and we know that average kinetic energy is also equal to 3 halves kBT. Well, they might be different, like, equations per se, right? But they're the same values, so, like, the value won't change. So this 10 joules, this is going to be 10 joules, it's the same. So if, they, if they're the same, then we can kind of set them equal to each other, right? So we can say half mv squared is equal to 3 halves kBT. And then we can solve for T. Right? So essentially, we can start plugging things in and solve for T. So we have half mv squared, right, times 2 thirds divided by kb will give us t, right? And so half this 2 will cancel out. So you're, you're, you're going to be left with like mv squared over 3 kb, I believe, because that 3 is just going to turn into 1 over 3. And so 1 over 3, that you're going to have the 3 in the denominator. So this should equal t, mv squared over 3 kb is equal to t. Anybody confuses how, to, how I got that? Or does that make sense? OK, cool. So then we just plug in like our mass. Let me actually kind of move things over here. It's a little bit easier to see. So we have our mass, which is a 6.64 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms times our RMS speed, right, which was the 518.8. Square that and then divided by 3 times our Boltzmann's constant, which is like 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23rd joules per Kelvin. And then that should give us our temperature. So, um, that should give you your temperature there, and i just give you guys a second there to um, calculate that. It looks like, on my end, it says that the microphone is acting up again. Can you guys still hear me all right? Okay, awesome. So, um... I still got 45.8. Um, depending on how you round it, I guess. Mine is a little off. I got 43.2 Kelvin. But if you did like 518.8, I suppose, or 519 or something, that might be enough to kind of throw it off a little bit. Or if you did 6.6 .6 times 10 to the negative 27 instead of 6.64. Um, but that, that shouldn't be like a huge issue, I don't think. But maybe double check just in case you might have made a mistake somewhere. But I got around 43.2. Let me check mine as well. Just to be sure that I didn't make a mistake or anything. Yeah, I got 43.2 as well again. Okay, cool. So we're on the same page, 43.2 Kelvin. So yeah, um, that's pretty much the gist of all this. 
And one you know, reminder here as well, when you're doing your average kinetic energy calculations, your V here is your RMS speed and not your average speed. So if this comes up like on a quiz on our exam or whatever, make sure to use your RMS speed here that you calculated um, as opposed to like the average speed. That's just the nature of the equation. So that sums up our written homework 10 for the week, I think. Yeah, written homework 10, yep. So hopefully that all made sense. Um, but yeah, I will probably stop the recording here um, for any questions or any other concerns of the like.